if gold were actually to hit 1700 or 1650 and keep going down, uh, this would indicate this triple top would indicate a bear market. Right now it's not, it's the potential for a bear market, but I don't think we're going to get there because there's too much going on fundamentally that people are demanding gold. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hey everyone, this is Rob Keens with GoldSilverPros.com bringing you the weekly market wrap up. It is June 2nd, 2023. We're now officially into June and we're headed towards summer. We'll be there in about three short weeks. And summer does change things a little bit for the gold market. So we're going to talk about that today, expectations of where we're going to be in the gold market. Plus, I've got a very special story for you on the Austrian government and how they're reducing cash or trying to get rid of cash and how the people or uh, how that is sitting with them, which is not particularly great. Let's go ahead and jump into it. As I look at the markets, gold and silver are doing okay. Gold right now, it's about 9 a.m. Central Time. It's trading at $1,964.40. Silver is at $2,372. Overall this week, they've done pretty well, although they've been sideways trading, trading for a while. I think overall they're okay. Uh, as we look at the rest of the markets, the Dow Jones, S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell 2000 are all up on the day, anywhere from about a third of a percent to a little over a percent. The Russell has the biggest gain at 1.38%, followed by the Dow Jones Industrial Average at up 1.19%. Uh, overall, the markets are doing okay. Uh, I think there's some positivity going on because of the thought that the, the debt deal and how that's going to go down. And I think there's a little bit of relief in the market. There's so a little bit of a rally. Uh, we still have yield curve inversion in the two and the 10 year bond. I mention it every single week because the longer this goes on, the stronger an indicator it is of an oncoming recession. As I look at the shorter dated treasuries, they're all up over 5% headlined by the six month, which is the highest at 5.488% in the four month, which is 5.466. Those are high rates for financing debt for the government. It increases their carrying costs and almost ensures that they're going to take on more of a deficit in the future as their <clears throat> um, as their capital raise costs have increased. And obviously, they wouldn't raise capital unless they had a shortfall. So an increase in the amount of debt service that you had automatically adds to the amount of cash that you have to refinance in the future. So this interest rate is going to get compounded into futures bond releases, which means I don't expect those bond rates to come down uh, anytime soon. Lots of different things occurring in the markets. And if I can get CNBC's tracker to work, we'll give you the cryptocurrencies. There we go. We've had about modest trading in Bitcoin. It's up. It's green on the day, 80 points, but it's still seeing that $26,000 range, 26,935. Uh, overall, Ethereum is at 1881.19. It's up 12 points. Again, they're all green. Litecoin is slightly down 1.45, almost nothing to 93.38. So really sideways trading cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency has been sitting about 26,000 Bitcoin a liter for a while. It got up to 30 and then kind of faded. Whether or not it gets up to 30,000 or above, we'll have to see. Summer's technically a little light for a lot of the financial markets, although, although I would say this summer, uh, this time could be a little bit different, especially considering what's going on in the market. We may see the reversal of some trends this summer, which is something I'll be talking about during the summer and doing some special videos on, so stay tuned in the channel for that. Looking at the economic data like we do every week, we have weakness in the S&P uh, Case Shiller Home Price Index over 20 cities, which is the leading indicator overall of how real estate is doing across major metropolitan areas. May not reflect your local market, but it's a good indication of where real estate is going overall, especially with regards to the mortgage and the paper market, which determines so much of real estate success regardless of where we're going. So even though the Case Shiller doesn't cover all the major cities or even all the different types of areas in the U.S., it's a good indicator of where that market is going. Given that we've had higher interest rates and tightening by the Fed, we've had some softness in real estate prices and uh, we're down 1.1% this past month. Consumer confidence also is falling. It, it had been very steady, well over 100 dating back to the fourth quarter of last year. Of course, that's the strongest time for consumers as they spend the most. We have the holiday season, a lot of excitement. That started to come off as we get closer to summer, which makes complete sense. Consumers are worried less about the financial markets, more about what they're doing for their summer plans. So that's fallen to 102.3. The Chicago business barometer has completely collapsed. It is down to a 40.4. Any print under a 50 is bearish, meaning there's a contraction. And it has fallen over 8% or eight points since last month, it printed 48.6. That is a huge contraction. The Empire State Manufacturing and the Texas Manufacturer are both down the Texas, uh, I'm sorry, uh, overall Texas charts down 12 straight months. So. Overall business, whether service manufacturing is not doing really well in the major areas in the U.S., 
which is telling us we're in an economic deflation. Price inflation is still elevated on goods that we need every day, like energy and food. That's to be expected. We're going to demand those no matter what. The, the markets for those are relatively inelastic. So prices can rise and fall. People are going to demand the same amount of food and shelter service they, that they need. And so some of those things are going to stay elevated. Energy will still uh, stay elevated, but we have deflation in other things as well, especially big ticket items. Employment numbers came out very rosy. ADP employment this week came out with 278,000 jobs created. That's the private payroll report. The government pay, uh, employment report, which has both uh, has two surveys, a payroll report and a household report, came in at 339,000 jobs. Those look really rosy. I don't trust those methodologies. The changes that have been made by the BLS to their government report, as well as ADP uh, to their private payroll report in the last six months, tell me that neither of those reports is really worth the paper they're printed on. There are always revisions afterwards. So I will tell you during the weekly market wraps when those are going up, but I'm also going to tell you the revisions. I do not believe those numbers at all. I don't think most people do either, but we'll continue to watch those as the revisions come out. Story of the week has to be with the Austrians. According to Remix News there in Austria, the people, over 5% of the people, I think it was 550,000 out of, uh, was it 8.9 million? I hope I'm getting my numbers correct, but I know it was over 5% had voted for this referendum to enshrine the use of cash in their constitution. Now the constitution, the Austrian one, does have a similar phrase that we have in the U.S. constitution around using, uh, coining, uh, government coining and things like that that was based on an older age. And now that we're in the fiat age uh, and we're moving to the central bank digital currency age, people want to stay with fiat and they don't want to go central bank digital currency, much like they want to stay with gold and didn't want to go to fiat. So the people are rejecting the idea of central bank digital currencies around the world in the nations which use the most cash and which nation in Europe uses the most cash. Well, that would happen to be Austria where over 50% of transactions are in cash. Can you imagine 50% of transactions being cash here in the United States? We'd be passing cash back and forth, right and left but we use more credit cards and electronic. Well, Germany also uses a lot of cash and they're rejecting it as well. Their population is rejecting. So the users of cash in Europe are rejecting. I think the central banks are trying to go after those first to get rid of the squeakiest wheels so that they can implement central bank digital currencies across these broad, broad swaths of regional economies, such as in Europe, the United States, Asia, PAC, and elsewhere, uh, South America, Africa, Middle East. So I believe that they're trying to address the squeakiest wheels first. If you look at the IMF research I've quoted many times, it takes about a generation for people to accept a big financial system or a currency system change and getting rid of cash is huge, especially in certain economies like the US, like Germany, like Austria, like Mexico and places like that, Switzerland that use a lot of cash. And so they have to kind of go after those first because it'd be the longest dated ones. It also is what tells me we're not ready right now for the universal adoption of central bank digital currencies that that's going to take some time and they're working on some of the soft things like getting people to accept it in some of the hardest places to do so, which are heavy, heavier cash. Plus they're also working on their technology. So a little bit of an update for you on what's going on in the cryptocurrency, especially the central bank digital currency, not the private crypto, but central bank digital currency part of the market. I think it's now time to go over the gold and silver charts, ladies and gentlemen. You can see I'm kind of motoring through this. I'm not taking my time whatsoever. I want to get through all the data and share it with you because there's a lot going on and we want to keep this short and sweet since it is a weekly market wrap. You can see I've opened up the volume and open interest chart on the CME group for gold. We've had a fair amount of volume leading up to the first couple of days of trading, but this is what I wanted to show you. We had 6,537 deliveries of gold on the first. And then if you go to Wednesday's data, we had 9,024. That's over 15,000 contracts. That's over 1.5 million ounces of gold, which comes out to over 3 billion. As soon as traders could get into that June contract because it had enough open interest, they went and delivered. Look, 9,000 deliveries on 11,000 contracts. That's almost a 90% delivery rate for this data. That is almost unheard of on the COMEX. You're lucky if you get a hundredth of a percent of the futures contracts actually result in a physical delivery where somebody's taking uh, possession of that gold. Now the gold may stay on the COMEX, ineligible, but it's not really for trade. It's actually changed physical hands. It's come off the COMEX as a tradable asset. They can put it back on if they wanted to, but that has been quote unquote delivered. And it means that somebody else wanted the gold and had it and they went and got it. 
And the fact that over 3 billion over the first two days in June have come off the market means that people were starved for gold and they're going to the industrial market to get it. How do we know this? Well, one indicator the last couple of months that I've been noticing is exchange for physical it noted in this column right here. When those numbers are elevated, it means people aren't getting the gold on COMEX, so they're going to London. That's the mechanism. You take a position on COMEX and you go to London and maybe you're playing price arbitrage, or maybe you're getting the physical that London market allows you to do both, but that indicates rising physical demand from the US where they're not able to get it. Why does that occur? We explain how the markets work. These markets work such that the derivative markets trade and it will, could have big physical delivery six months out of the year. That's where the, the physical trades concentrate. The other six months are lighter months. Why? It's a futures month. It's a bet on a future price. They don't need every month to be a big month. They're going to rotate every two to three months. That's why you get six big ones every year in gold and silver and then six that are small. And they rotate months. Gold and silver both have a big month in December because it's to close the year, obviously. But during the year, they have different checkpoints during the year, depending upon the dynamics of that market. OK, so when we see a lot of demand like we do on this chart, it basically means in the next month in which they can deliver, they're going to June was the one that had the next big amount of contracts and you can see them delivering. Hopefully I've explained that dynamic for you. In other words, that means there's huge physical demand going into the summer, which is why I don't think the price is going to fade as much as summer as it has in previous uh, typical summers. We'll watch it and I'll cover that on the weekly market wrap for you. Going to the settlement data, we do this to look at how the price is affected. Obviously the dominant uh, pricing contract is in August even though the deliveries are occurring in June. So deliveries occur in the, in the near term month that you're in. And typically the biggest deliveries occur in the first couple of trading days of that month. And those start actually before the month starts. It's one or two days before the month starts, you start to get the, the claim on the gold. So that's why we saw on the 31st of May, the first day that you could get in there and start making those physical deliveries, even though it was before June. That's where you'll get the settlements in the, in the current month. Usually the first few days of that current month is, traders line up to get it right off the bat. They want to be the one to actually get it. They know that not all those contracts are ever going to be deliverable in gold. So they line up in the first few days, but the pricing actually occurs in the future again, because the spot price is determined by futures, not physical trade. So here's where we see the gold price, 1995, 10. Uh, so far on Thursday's day, they're not giving us Friday's data just yet. It's too early in the day to capture Friday's data, but you can see that price action. If we go back to Wednesday, a nice little move of five bucks as well. I just provide that information so you know how that works. On silver, we're going to do the same thing. Silver volume has been fairly robust going up just a little bit as we get ready for June. There have been a fair amount of deliveries in silver, nothing like gold, only three and three contracts. Of course, it's 5,000 out silver, but the value of that contract is much less than the 9,000 golds that we saw delivered because gold price is much higher. Uh, overall, total volume is very healthy. July is a very active month and it looks like we're setting up for uh, September and December to be the last two really active months for silver. We've seen some rotation out of July already. As we get into June, people want to position further into the future for their price arbitrage and to make their little pennies on their contracts. So we're seeing rotation out of July into September. You look at the settlement data. This is Thursday settlement data up about 40 cents uh, in July, up about 40.1 cents in September. That means until September, we should have very strong uh, contractual or paper demand for silver as we're seeing nice prices bid up in future months, which aren't the dominant ones. So overall silver market, very healthy. I'm not going to go over the ETF data this week because there's not a big change from last time, but I did want to let you know that there are a ton of deliveries. And I also wanted to take a look at a chart. Uh, something I found very interesting is what's happening in the gold chart, especially as we set up for going into the summer. Let's get this uh, nice and big for you guys. So I graphed out the gold chart here in the middle. And then on top and bottom, I have different indicators, how this chart is basically presented. I will say that we have an oversold indicator on the RSI, which is more of a medium term signal and a short term on the MACD, like a 26 period, 26 and 12 days. We're oversold to so both in the short and medium term. It looks as though gold is oversold from a technical perspective, meaning there's been so much paper sold the paper, that they sold more paper than the trend in uh, that trade indicated which means traders are more likely to flip long or at least less likely to dump a bunch of more paper. Uh, given the trade, that doesn't mean it can't happen. It's just an indicator that the market's probably going to get a little bit stronger in price terms as we move forward because these in technical indicators are soft. However, we do have a triple top forming in gold dating back to 2020, the pandemic. So we had that all time high. We challenged that all time high again and actually got slightly higher on a, on a blip chart, not on a close. 
Uh, so this will be considered the previous, you know, the all time, all time high right here. This would be the runner up. And now we've got another one forming where we're mid to high 1900s. And we're not at the previous all time high, but we're close enough that this is effectively a triple top. Now, typically a triple top is a bearish pattern. It means that you try to price three times over time and that traders are going to be fatigued and they're going to let it fall off. The confirmation of this as a bearish market indicator is when the market falls back through the support line. The support line is where the bottoms were in this range. So we had a support here, a support here, a support here. This one fell a little bit more. So I've got two support lines, but 1700 seems to be 1650 to 1700 seems to be that support price. If gold were actually to hit 1700 or 1650 and keep going down, uh, this would indicate this triple top would indicate a bear market. Right now it's not, it's the potential for a bear market, but I don't think we're going to get there because there's too much going on fundamentally that people are demanding gold. We know that people are pulling gold off the COMEX. I talked about how they pulled $3 billion worth over 1.5 million ounces in the first two days of June, the first big delivery month we've had in a couple of months. That means there's pent up demand. We've seen EFP numbers where people go into London and try to get that gold because they can't get it off the COMEX. Okay, so there's big physical demand going on. We know from a retail side, we've seen it too. And typically this slows down in the summer and you would think the triple top compared with a typical slowdown in summer would be extremely bearish for gold and it could fall. We could fall in the $1,800, $1,900 range or, you know, uh, low $1,900 range or maybe even $1,700. I don't think we will because everybody continues to buy physical, but we'll continue to watch that. At the end of the day, I think we're going to be okay. And I'm going to do a special video on this chart and why I think it's not as important. So stay tuned to uh, the channel for that and we'll get into that. Overall, to summarize, weakening economic data, uh, gold and silver are doing okay. Potentially uh, an over, uh, I'm sorry, a triple top condition forming on the gold chart, which if we don't have, continue to have physical, good, strong physical demand and we don't have any continued bad news this summer, gold could fade down a little bit this summer. That's what the charts tell us. But given the demand, I don't think it will. Austrians are, uh, protesting over not being able to use cash and the government, the two main parties of the government, not allowing them to enshrine the right to cash in the constitution. And they're not going to, because they're going to go central bank digital currencies. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. So the cash areas uh, becoming over in Austria and then being such a high cash use nation, it's going to be a lot of growing pains for them, a lot of protests for them. But I think that the central banks are doing it in the hardest to capture markets first, because they know it's going to take longer. They get a got to get the buy-in of the cash using nations first into central bank digital currencies before anybody else because they will protest very loudly if they don't so squeaky wheel gets the grease they got to address those so i see similar provisions probably coming to germany switzerland mexico other high cash using nations certain nations in asia as well as the central banks try to move us into central bank digital currency era i think that's going to take some time stay tuned to the channel as we continue to bring you the weekly market wrap-ups and continue to bring you the best on the stories of the week as well as the economic data and we show you exactly what's happening in gold and silver we'll continue to do that as you stay uh focused right here on this channel and don't leave the channel we have other content down there below for you to look at as well that i'm pretty sure is going to be helpful to you and educate you on the dynamics of the gold in the financial markets. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is Rob Keats with Gold Silver Pros. Hey, thanks for watching. We selected these videos just for you. Check them out. And remember, $4.99 a month keeps the lights on and the channel going. So join our Gold Silver Pro supporter membership. We appreciate your support. Keep stacking.